Hello and a very warm welcome. My name's David Roth from WPP and it's an absolute pleasure and delight to have you watching this broadcast live from the World Retail Congress 2019 here in Amsterdam. This is the place where the world's retail leaders come to discuss the issues that are impacting retail today. And boy, are there a lot of issues that are impacting retail. And we've been catching up with a number of them during the course of the first day of this Congress in order to understand what some of those issues are and to discuss some of the solutions. I hope you'll enjoy this hour's worth of broadcasting live from the World Retail Congress 2019. Well, I'm now joined by Volta Kolik, who is the uh, chief executive for uh, Europe and Indonesia for Achold. Volta, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, how do you delight the customer in today's crazy retail environment? <laughs> yes. Well, uh, thankfully, uh, not, uh, not only me, but uh, everybody who works at Achold is, is doing that every day. So that's the good thing. That we do that already for centuries. But I, and I think we do that in our stores, we do that on our online services, uh, so in, in many different ways, uh, by offering, of course, uh, uh, the right product, the right service at, at the right price. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's something which is really in our DNA to serve customers and, and to help them. We do that also via local brands. Uh, so, so people, customers don't know Ahl de Les, but they know the brands in the different countries and they love the brand. We put a lot of effort in making the brand strong. So that's what we work on every day. Um, around the world, customers are um, getting, I suppose, more and more uh, picky about exactly what they want. Um, yeah. They're becoming more sophisticated consumers. Absolutely. What strain does that put on um, the retail organization from a buying perspective right the way through to uh, a, a, I suppose, a in-store activation perspective. Yeah. And, and no, it, 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 it means a lot of uh, uh, innovation on our side uh, to, to bring also the new uh, ideas and the new concepts uh, quickly to the table. So that requires some, some speed of action on our side. Uh, the good news how, how difficult is that within the organization? Well, it, it's not so difficult. Uh, I, I think uh, a lot of, we have a lot of talented people working for us who, can, who also can think of new concepts and new ideas quite quickly. Uh, it be, because we are quite big, uh, making it scalable and making it available on, on, a, on a bigger scale is sometimes difficult. So that's not always easy. Um, but you, you, we have a quite an adaptive organization to be able to, to go and, uh, quickly about uh, new things. But on the other hand, we, also, we are also not a, uh, uh, we are also not a startup. We are a kind of like a legacy player sure. with a lot of legacy. Yes. <laughs> and so sometimes you have to work your way around it and use a lot of creativity to be able to do that. I mean, and, a lot uh, of people, commentators are saying, the old legacy retailers are, yeah. are dead. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, clearly, uh, you're a little you know, that's a, not true. You know, <laughs> alive and kicking. Yes. 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 <laughs> so, no, but so, we, we so, do so, know. But what advantages? I mean, you know, there must yeah. be a whole series of advantages that yeah. legacy players have. In Absolutely. And, and, and I'm also a very strong believer in focus on your strength and, of course, and try to fix the other things. So, so we have a lot of uh, buying power. We have a lot of customers who already shop at us which, where we can try new things. Uh, so we have a lot of trust in our brands who are, for many years, very old and still uh, are highly ranked. But we just need to keep on fighting to keep that trust going. So, so that is the good thing. I mean, we can, for instance, we, we, can, we have in the Netherlands here a thousand stores. If we want to try something new, we use a couple of stores. We see what, what works and then we either scale up or scale. There's not a lot of other retailers who have or, uh, or other players who have that opportunity to get so close and so connected with the customers. And, and, and sometimes we can just use also new tooling, like, hey, give us a rating, give us this, give us... So, so I, I think we sometimes underutilize our strengths in a way, 
uh, but we uh, we have uh, absolutely opportunities to uh, to move also in the new world. And, and those opportunities clearly include physical. Um, and yeah. again, there are many people who would yeah. say, you know, r you know, 101 now, cut as much physical as yeah. you can, you're not doing that. So what do yeah. you see within physical yeah. that is so A lot. alluring? A lot, because because if you look at our physical store, if you only look at it already for four years ago, we had a lot of non-food in it. Uh, we didn't have hardly any food services in it. We we, we put the, the non-food online, so we sell it at ball.com, which is our non-food uh, online player. Uh, and we've moved uh, space around in our store, have more food for now, have sushi corners, have more uh, space for fresh, for bakeries, for deli. Uh, we also completely uh, uh, overhauling it and become more digital. So there's no paper, there are more digital experience in the store. We made uh, the shopping experience easier. So you, know, you can pay with your card, uh, you don't have to stand in line, uh, we've reduced the, the checkout, so, so there's a lot going on. And, and we still believe as the store as instant gratification, you go in and you go out and you quickly get your hot coffee, but also your groceries or whatever you need. We have, uh, we have very convenient locations where we are always in the proxi proximity of a neighborhood and nothing beats that experience yes. if you have to wait for online. So, but we are constantly, uh, uh, investing and changing our stores to be more adaptive of what is necessary. And yeah. are, are you seeing a big divide between the way millennials shop and yeah. the way everybody yeah. else shops? Yeah. yeah. And what are you going to do about yeah. it? No, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I be there for both of them. Yeah. I mean, uh, so I mean, I mean, joking aside, is no. that a very complicated thing to do? No. no. Right. No, no, because because ultimately, um, uh, you know, what millennials want is actually something that uh, older people like like us uh, also want. Uh, you don't think we're millennials? <laughs> well, maybe Sadly not. not. <laughs> <laughs> we might have the dream, mindset. We right? might have the mindset, but we <laughs> yes, are technically yeah, yeah. we're not. <laughs> but uh, no, but uh, I, I think they they want. Companies who, who take a stand in, in certain uh, areas, like what are you doing for the environment, like what is the transparency of your products, where is it coming from, uh, they are digitally more savvy than others. But yeah, we need to be adoptive and, and, and people are used to order their travel, their hotels, everything online and of course grocery online or at least searching for recipes, how to cook. Yeah, we, we need to be there and, and, and we have a lot of, we are actually in the Netherlands the biggest employer of millennials. So we have them, and we, cause we, we also said like, oh, how do we deal with the millennials? I said, well, let's ask our people in this who work with us because you know, they can also design things that are fit for millennials. So, um, and are they, are they listened to within the organization? Well, uh, they, they probably say no. <laughs> <laughs> I think yes, but uh, because you never listen enough. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, I, I think we want to be there for everybody. So it's not only a millennial company. We also have a lot of elderly people who like to go to the store, who like to be serviced. Uh, so, and, and, and they are basically as big as a population. Uh, as the millennial are, and 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 then of course, uh, we have the role to play to be there for everybody, and 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 we can. The, the, the fun part is we employ also people who are already, you know, 60 plus and work here already for 40 years, and we have people who are, you know, who are 20 and who just work here for two years and have a strong opinion, but we sometimes put them in the room and we find a solution. That's a, yeah. a nice balance. You also look after Indonesia. Indonesia yeah. is one of the yeah. countries yeah. has the youngest population in the world, one of the fastest growing <laughs> well, yeah, middle yeah, yeah. class in the world. Yeah. What uh, insights can you give us? Well, in the, the, the Indonesia is a fascinating uh, business. Uh, we have it already for 20 years. Um, I have traveled a lot to, to, to Asia, to, to, to Shanghai and Beijing, and of course talked with all the, the big players there and see what's going on. Uh, and the funny thing is you, you see that, that kind of, uh, because they're highly urbanized areas. So you see the store has also a different role. It has much more also a role for last mile delivery, yes. for food for now. Uh, so we can experiment a lot with local players uh, like Gojek or other uh, uh, kind of uh, companies who can provide that together with us. So for us, it's, it's an, a very interesting learning ground on, on, on these concepts because they are not so mature here in Europe yet. Uh, the other uh, end is, is that, yeah, there is a big population, it is growing, uh, they are very uh, value conscious. Um, everybody knows the price of a chicken, an egg yes. and, and all the other uh, staples. Uh, so there is a growing need for, for more fresh. Uh, we can bring in a lot of know-how know uh, to, to local farmers and to help 
to, to have a better crop so that they can serve us as a strategic partner. So that's what we've learned a lot with our strategic partners over in, in the past couple of years. So we can apply that in Indonesia because, you know, we cannot ship goods to Indonesia. It's really silly. I mean, it's a, a rich country. So for us, it's, it's uh, we have young talent working there, uh, also from Europe and also from Indonesia. So it's, it's also an interesting. I've worked myself four years in Asia. Uh, 20 years ago, setting up a business there, which was, uh, for me, an enriching experience. And now we've also sent some new talents there who have the same kind of experience. So, 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 so mixing... Yeah, so we can learn, we can learn a lot ways, from yeah. what's going on, especially what's coming down from, from yes. China. We can, uh, we can learn from that. We can also uh, give our talents also an opportunity to work there, create also new talents uh, in, uh, in the area, because uh, for, for, for to have a position there as an international player is also for the Indonesian government uh, because we treat workers uh, in a different way than the, their locals do. So we can uh, so so they like us a lot and they want us to kind of advocate like okay how do you work together how do you work with a purpose led company and also we can also send talent there to work and experience a completely different you know way of working a different culture a di which which makes everybody a richer person. So. Yeah. Now, one last question. Yes. Um, in, a, in a few words, maybe even one word. <laughs> how would you sum up the retail times that we're in? Super exciting. <laughs> yeah. They are very exciting. And, and I always look at it from a positive point of view because you can sometimes wake up and you think, oh my God, how are we going to do this? But it is exciting. Well, yeah. that's a fantastic way of ending us. Well, thank you thank so you. much indeed for joining us. All much right. Appreciate thank it. you very much. Well, I'm now here with Francesca Danzi, who is the Chief Client Officer for Tory Burge. Francesca, it's delightful to have you with us here at the World Retail Congress. My pleasure. What do women want? Wow. Um, women want to be empowered. Women want to get that confidence, and they also want to be understood at an emotional level. Because there's much more than behind the purchase of a piece of clothing, right? There's, there's an intent, there's, there's something that is an emotional need. And so I think that's a big challenge for us. We are a brand who is founded on, on giving confidence and, and inspiring women to live life in color. We're all about color positivity patterns. Uh, but the challenge today is like, how do you connect when you scale and grow, as we are doing? How do you maintain that connection? And how do you, be, you, you start to intercept the customer need before it's manifested? Because as the, the topic of the company is all about speed and, and pace, uh, we can't just wait that they, are, that they tell us. So we need to be there, and we need to be there when and where they decide to engage with us. Well, you're at the forefront of fashion. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that uh, uh, you're always before the trend as opposed to uh, at the trend or, heaven forbid, after the trend? Right. So we're at the forefront, but our unique proposition is not necessarily innovation in terms of product and crazy, crazy things. It's more around the authenticity of the brand that comes from like a, 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 a traveler type of route. So it's about tourists being inspired in her travels by cultures, by colors, by art, and how she brings all of that together to design products and clothes that don't cost a fortune. Because that was always her aim. We are actually not in the luxury space. We are at the top of what is called the contemporary lifestyle segment. And we want to inspire women, give access to beautiful clothes and accessories to women to increase their confidence. To make them feel even more empowered. Is there a not a, a dilemma? You know, you're growing very, very fast. Yes. Um, when you started off, it was a, a niche brand. People found it, yes. um, loved it. Yes. Um, and there was some, although not as you say, at the top end of the luxury market, there was some exclusivity around it. Yes. Um, now it becomes more ubiquitous, you're yes. expanding uh, across the world. China, I know, is a very important market for you as well. Yes, um, totally. How do you manage that tension then between um, it being available everywhere and, and that specialness that what women want? Yes. So the important thing is to understand who wants the specialness and who instead wants the accessibility and who wants the community aspect, for example. So that's exactly what we're trying to do. As we are moving towards a 
one market that serves the market a one type of model, right? Uh, we need to become much more localized. And so we are investing, and that's the, hence my role, it's a new role never existed in the organization before, we're investing in customer research and understanding how to flex inventory, store concepts, the type of experience that we offer to our customers to give that exclusivity to the customers who need that uh, through products, through capsule collections, through exclusive experiences. We can't invite everyone to the show, but we can invite some people to the show. So like, how do you flex and try to intercept that need and create those experiences, create those products that would, that would really fit them? Now, now, one of the themes even emerging from just the first few hours was the notion of experiences being much more important uh, in the in the buying process uh, today for retailing. What, what experiences are you trying to create? Are you thinking of creating yeah. um, that merge? I suppose the product proposition, the the, the 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 concept that people have in the brand, and something that's unique right. together. So I think in terms of experience. It, it is, we have a way to go. So Tori, the brand was born with some innovation there. It was one of the first brands that basically was giving iPads with, uh, to, to the stores and they were uh, giving iPads to men who were going to shop with their wives and playing foot. Basically there was football on the iPads. They could sit down, they, we had beers in the fridge. So like it My was- My sort of a store. The whole, <laughs> yeah. Exactly, so if you still ask customers in North America, men in North America that accompany their wife, they can tell you that a great time because they could just hang out and stay there and do whatever they wanted. So the experience was already thought for the North America customer, the typical couple the shops that way. What we have to do is find what's relevant today to different customers in different local areas because we're very North America led still despite the fact that we are growing exponentially in China and we've just hired a president for Europe, so you'll hear from us in the European market very soon, good, more, good. more <laughs> like strongly and boldly. Uh, but that's exactly our area of development, hence my role, hence a new CEO who just joined in, uh, in January. We're gonna focus on experiences and what, those, what that means in different cultures. Now, um a lot of people have been talking about the importance of data yes. uh, and using that data in order to shine a light on uh, uh, where yes. you should um, uh, spend money, where you shouldn't, etc., to create different propositions. Yes. Um, how much data do the stores and the websites throw out and what plans have you got in order to harness that or maybe increase the data and yeah. understanding? So we have a lot of data. So it's more around utilizing the data. And we are in that phase where we're bringing the data all in one, under one platform. So once we do that, we have already a number of sources of data we're starting to analyze. But when we have all of it, the point is, how do you create a custom, customer analytics or analytics on top with an agile, real-time type of software and platform that is able to feed you with that relevant piece of information at the right time? Actually, not information, but insight. So I think we are already literally writing an RFP because there are lots of these companies, startup right now, their aim and their goal is to give you analytics and insight on all of these disparate sources of data. So we are right there. We do already use some of the data. For example, we do connect online and offline. Uh, our stores have clientele, a clientele tool, so they look at the customer profile, they understand what they shopped and their, their likes, and they can create a personalized recommendation at store level. Um, but the opportunity, for example, to connect the contact center or to connect the social media, it's huge. We're not there yet, but it's on the roadmap. Now, one of the challenges of, uh, I suppose, a young company mm -hmm. um, is, is going global, yes. um, operating in different markets, different time zones, very different customers. Um, yes. You're growing um, at a rapid rate in China. What are the um, observations, challenges that you've encountered operating in China for the first time? Right, so interestingly, in China, we have a younger customer and we have a customer that perceives us as more luxury. So how do is you... That, is, that a, is that a good thing? <laughs> is it, well, it's a good thing <coughs> that we have a younger customer. It's totally yeah. good because we do need to focus on attracting a younger population in North America, for example. Um, and then they position us in pure luxury. 
The good thing about that is that they are paying full price with no questioning. While the North American market is very specific and has gone down the spiral yes. of promotions in the recent, you know, maybe last four or five years. So I think we have something to look at there, understand how do they perceive, how do they get that value? Obviously, they get an understanding of perception of value uh, that is different from what we, we have in North America. So that is quite interesting for us to look at their model and to see what is it that we can actually take from there rather than the other way around, which is quite interesting, right? You think you would export, kind of taking learning from Well, there. I think many people are realizing actually that uh, in many respects, China and Asia, when it comes to retailing, understanding the customer and the technologies to merge those things together are ahead. way ahead of what, uh, what we've been doing for, you know, for, for, uh, for a long time. Totally agree. Well, not one last question. Yes. Um, and that is, um, in one word, maybe two words. Yes. How would you sum up the times that we're living in now from a retail perspective? Hmm. It's the time of machine and, hu and humanity. It's the time of, actually it's a time of great collaboration and I see a time of great stimulation. I think retail is, has been steady for too long. I think now I finally, I see energy. And I think the fact that we have machines and AI possibilities, it's so incredibly stimulating and that will help dialing up the human side at the same time. Well, that's quite an um, interesting uh, uh, perspective uh, to take. Um, and I think that whole notion of where human rhythms meet algorithms is a, you know, it's a very interesting area that I'm sure we'll be Don't delving any. further into in the future. For the moment, uh, Francesca, uh, Chief Client Officer for Tory Birch, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Very welcome. Thank you. Well, last night at the World Retail Congress, we officially launched the Brand Z Top 75 Most Valuable global retail brands and that report is available for you to download at www.brandz.com. Let's take a look at the brands that have made up the 2019 Brand Z Top 75 Most Valuable Global Retail Brands. Mm -hmm.
Well, Jose Blanco, the Vice President for Asian Markets for Guests, has just uh, joined us. Jose, we've just done um, a panel together uh, at the World Retail Congress here in Amsterdam. Thank you very much indeed for uh, participating in that. My pleasure. Um, so let's cover some of the, maybe some of the ground that we talked about then and maybe some, uh, uh, some new ground. Um, you have an amazing amount of experience uh, in, uh, in Asia. Uh, and in China in particular. How would you sum up retailing in China today? Well, it's, um, it's a learning process. It's a kind Still. of, yeah, yeah, it's a never ending game. And you know, for us who come from outside, uh, you have to, to learn about everything, you know, about the culture, about organization, behavior inside China, about competition, about what the customer is expecting. You, you, you keep learning and learning. I think it's a kind of, if you are engaged with what you are doing, then it's a, it's a good game to, to be there. One of the things we discussed uh, at length on the panel was this whole notion of China speed. I mean, maybe 20 times, 15 times, I don't know, faster than anywhere else. Um, what challenges does that give you both from a keeping up with the consumer and also you know, running a business and making that business profitable? Yeah, it's a kind of, um, you have to, to keep working and working and working. The, the, the big difference with any other market is stores never close. No matter of line on line, it's seven days per week, always open. And this same um, behavior happens with everything in the, in the business. So. Uh, First, it's about, okay, how hardworking you and your organization can be in order to deal with the speed. Because as soon as you take a rest or as soon as you stop for a break, you are out. You, you will be out of, of the business. No? And together with, with this speed, it's, it's also to understand that the, the speed is happening in many different dimensions. And um, you have to pay attention to all of them in order to ensure you are not missing any of them. These dimensions can go from uh, competition, local or international, can be how you have to deal with social media, your marketing, the influencers. Five years ago they were saying we are lack of shopping malls, now they are saying oversupply of shopping malls. Yeah. So, so everything happens really very, very fast. No? So you have to to be there and that the speed, but also you have to ensure that everything you do, it makes sense. Because if you are doing too many things because of the speed, and then you realize they are not the proper one, it's also something that can impact you and your business. Now, um, Chinese competitors, not just international brands, are fierce in China. How do you continue to differentiate your offer from a local Chinese competitor? That's, um, um, we look at it from two different sides. One, one side is, is, is like if, if you go to, to your stores, you remove the logo from the entrance, you look inside and you see, is the customer going to recognize you or not? If you are able to answer this question, that's good. You should. Uh, so in order to ensure the customer is answering this question, you have to do a lot of Okay, you have to be very consistent in your communication. You have to do a lot of communication and be very consistent in every different channel. No, and for sure in your stores, no matter offline stores or online stores. Uh, this communication and this consistency in the communication has to be about who you are, what is your DNA as an international brand, and what kind of things you are offering that they don't have. From the other side, it's very important in order to compete with the local market, with the local brands, to ensure they are looking at you as someone executing the brand locally, with a local team. The closer you are with them through your local team, from the store associates to the whoever is working in the, in the head office, the closer you will be with them. If you have both things, then it's going to work. Now, um, you are expanding fast uh, in China. Um, a lot of people are saying around the world that uh, the thing that you don't want anymore is physical stores. 
You have a lot of physical stores in China. What's your view on physical versus virtual? We have seen that no matter how big or how important is Alibaba, Tencent, Jindong, physical stores, offline stores is still 80% of the market and it's not, it's not going to be less. And in fact, you can see with all these omni-channel new retail, what they are doing is just moving from online to offline mm -hmm. and trying to catch the sales from offline mm -hmm. because they realize that's very close to the, to the, to the limit. I mean, actually, online. we're seeing a, a flattening off of growth of e-commerce in, in China. Because there is no more customer base. They have the whole customer base already. So offline is a must. And it's not only because it's 80% of the market, but because this is where the customer is going to see you. They are going to see you online, they are going to see you offline. It's a customer, it's, I mean, China is a, is a culture driven by experience. You have to interact with them. Maybe not as you were interacting before, just through product, but now it has to be through product, content. But this content has to be both online and offline. Content is becoming more and more uh, important to feed the social media beast uh, in China. H how, what's your approach to creating content? Are you creating it specifically for the China market or are you using content that's generated globally? We have both. We have all contents coming from global to ensure the brand consistency is there. And we are taking all of them and in parallel developing a specific content both for e-commerce channels and social media channels. And of course, the influencers we are using are local influencers that can connect directly with the, with the Chinese customer. Now, local um, uh, influencers, probably a China phenomenon at the moment, but I, I'd imagine it's going to go global. How, how do you choose the influencer or, in a sense, or, or do they choose themselves by virtue of, of, of their power? The reality is about money. <laughs> <laughs> they are becoming more and more and more expensive. So some of them, maybe you want to choose them, you cannot afford because at the end you have to, to manage a budget. No? But uh, once you are in your, let's say, wh whatever you can afford, it's a conversation. I mean, you have to find the one who is connecting with your customer profile, the one who is representing your brand DNA. And of course, in our case, who has been always, it's a brand who has been always looking for who is going to be the next supermodel, the next big influencer, uh, trying to find this, this segment of, of influencers in China. The, the key is like, you talk through them more than through yourself. No, the brand is introduced to the customer through, the, through these influencers. You've um, spent a lot of time in China. You also worked with, uh, with Zara for a number of years. Um, is the concept, I suppose, which Zara pretty much created, of fast fashion, um, has, has that had its day? The, the, the thing, from my point of view, is like, Zara has, has done an amazing job telling the customer how they have to behave in their stores. <laughs> So it's just about operations. And Sarah has a very well-organized supply chain in which everything comes to the store by magic, by magic. So customer is there, product is there, you just run the, the business. No? While when you are outside of that, um, you have to redesign, rethink what is your approach with the customer, how you are going to develop the customer journey. And that's key, it's about product, it's about customer, and it's about the operations of the store. So we, have, we, we take these three vectors and try to organize in order to ensure, again, it's completely consistent with the, with the message of the company. But it's much more complicated from the point of view that uh, there is not only one vector and the other two are coming directly kind of magic is, is the three of them you have to handle together. And finally, um, how would you characterize the, the time that we're in, uh, in China, in retail at the moment, if you had to sum it up in a few words? Innovation, engagement, proud of themselves, uh, omni-channel, um, 
I think that's some of the, the key concepts that are happening now. Well, there are sort of balls to have in the air all at once. Uh, Jose Blanco, the VP for Asia Markets for Guest, thank you very much indeed for joining me here. And thank you also for being uh, a, a fantastic uh, panellist of the panel I chaired a little bit earlier today. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, I'm now joined by two entrepreneurs, Kimberly Carney, the founder and CEO of Fashwire, and Adam Itai, the Chief Strategy Officer for SuperApp. A very warm welcome, both of you. Likewise. Great to be here. Um, Thank let's you. start a little bit talking about uh, your creation, your business, your entrepreneurial venture. What is it? What does it do? All as right, it positioned so fashion, in this retail, in this wonderful retail this crazy space, crazy world of retail and digital. Yeah, um, Fashwire is a multi-brand marketplace connecting fashion designers directly to consumers through on one platform. That's a Tinder swipe right, swipe left data. Point. I know nothing about Tinder. You know, of course, <laughs> none of us do. Um, it, the, really, the deliverable to the industry is hard metrics of consumer preferences, preferences in real time. And we've grown in the last year from 30 to over 200 designers. Right. And um, it's been great seeing all these designers come together on one platform. Fantastic. Uh, and the designers are, are Contemporary. state, states work yeah, or Yeah, no, it's now? worldwide. So we, um, we've targeted the London shows. So we have Spain, London, um, all over Europe, really. And, um, and then, obviously, the US. OK, fantastic. Adam. Yeah, so SuperApp is a uh, mobile-centric personalized shopping and marketing platform for retailers. So basically our solution, um, we white-label it for uh, retailers, uh, global retailers from different sectors, whether it's health and beauty, groceries, um, uh, drugstores, fashion. Um, and we help retailers actually um, engage consumers in a better way on mobile. Um, if we look at the solutions today that uh, e-commerce are introducing to consumers, uh, it was mostly mimicked from the web. And that's why today when, uh, when you look on the numbers of conversions in mobile, you said that there is a big gap between what mobile is generating and, and the web. Uh, so we kind of re redesigned, reinvented how shopping should, uh, should be on mobile. And we help uh, retailers um, better um, utilize that channel. Great. Well, you're both here together with a number of other entrepreneurs at the World Retail Congress to to what to 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 show off uh, uh, your innovations to get retailers interested, intrigued, wanting to engage. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, being an entrepreneur. What what on earth made you want to create your own business and create a a concept that nobody else had thought of and take it from an idea to reality? So I actually own a retail store. We'll talk later <laughs> in Seattle and. Um, so many designers wanted to get into my store and you know with my store it's on my budget and I have to carry the AGs, the theories and the bigger brands because they're my revenue and these smaller designers I thought gosh there has to be a way to make this digital so they can be on one platform because their biggest complaints were the trade shows were too expensive so they were flying out and cold walking the stores and so and that's how I came up with it to give one platform. And was it, was it one eureka moment where we've been thinking about it for a while and yeah, because in a sense, the difference between everybody else and entrepreneurs is everybody else has ideas and does nothing with them, and entrepreneurs actually do something with it. You know, it, it was. It was a moment of um, actually um, just these designers that I would get to know and I would like them. And, you know, part of owning a store and working with your the brands is the relationships you build. And, I, you know, and I'm from dot com time. So, what, what I, my idea was, well, you know, everybody else out there has to go through retailers or brokers to get brands and so many of these fashion apps are masquerading as a designer solution when they're really a retailer solution and we've actually targeted those trade shows and walked the floors and developed those relationships and all of our designers signed up have contracts just with contracts just with us and so so yeah it was this moment where we need to do this and I you know hired a developer that one didn't last. <laughs> and then um, I found the Endgame developer, and we're just, and I did hire an amazing advisory board to come on and really guide me. And I, yeah. you know, we have an eBay, you know, product officer. We have Deborah Winesweek, who's here at the show, and we have these different advisors who guide well, me. Deborah's great. This. Yeah, she's, had, she's been a great advisor yes. for Bashwire. So. What's your route to entrepreneurialism? 
if that's a word? Well, you have to have a, a very solid vision. I think that you have the ability to see something that um, probably no, no one else sees besides you. Uh, as, as an entrepreneur, you probably you have a vision uh, that you um, you can you know you can throw the rock as far as you can as far as you can probably imagine, and uh, be willing to uh, to sacrifice a lot in order to uh, in order to get there. Um, for Supra, for instance, it's, it became as a vision of one man, Roy, which is the CEO, the founder of the company. Uh, when he held the uh, the first um, iPhone. Uh, he realized back in 2008 when e-commerce was just, uh, you know, something that people barely even used, uh, that uh, this is the future of, uh, of this uh, sector of e-commerce, and that's how people are going to shop. And uh, this, this idea, this vision of Superp was already uh, was born uh, already back then. Now, one of the things they say about being an entrepreneur is um, it's tough on the entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> how has that manifested itself in your life? Well, sleep's not an option. <laughs> um, yeah. I love the drive of being an entrepreneur. So you, you do sacrifice your personal life. You do, I'm a single mom. You know, fortunately I have a great um, a dad to my children who is um, really tag, tag teams us with me as, you know, single parents. And, um, but everything else you're just you're so focused on that end game and what you can do for your designers and like for me in this in this um, world of designers who are so excited to get on your platform because they'll look at it and they'll be like oh we've seen and then all of a sudden like oh there's nothing like this we want to get on and trust in us and believe in us to take us there and I feel like it's my job you know whatever we need to do whether I need to put up the images for the designers whether I need to be out here to show or whatever we do you just you keep going and um, how, how do you take the knocks I mean if you look back at many uh, of the classic entrepreneurs who've gone on to create massive businesses their first few years or even first 10 15 years were uh, had many many uh, uh, failures how, how do you take those knocks do you take it very personally? I mean. Oh, no, never. I mean, you should never take it personal. Um, I think if you don't fail, you don't, you don't learn. I think, uh, and that, I think that's the test of an entrepreneur. Is Absolutely. How, how do you get up from, from a failure? Uh, and if you just failed and quit, then I guess you're not an entrepreneur. Yeah. Because entrepreneur is about keep going, it's about learning from your experience, it's about uh, uh, learning the lesson and just uh, come back stronger. I think this is a, it's more of a character. It's like you're born with it. Uh, entrepreneurs, uh, real entrepreneurs, I think that this is, uh, you know, you, you know that you can't work for anybody else. Um, so true. You want to, you really want to be there, right? You, you really want to be there to, uh, you to fulfill your own vision. Yeah. yeah. And I think that what's, what's really intrigues me, especially in, if we're talking about high tech and, and in today's uh, ecosystem and environment, it's like, you are in charge of so many things uh, in this type of business. It's like all of a sudden, it's like the, the fundraising and the marketing and, and everything that it goes and operations and the yeah. development <laughs> and the product. And it's, it's like literally everything. You're, you have to you're be cheap of all of those. Exactly. <laughs> Eventually, yeah. it's all, it's all rolls to you. And I think that one of the tests of an entrepreneur, uh, super up now, we're, we're about 65 people and we're scaling, we're growing. Is, and I just had this conversation with Troy, uh, the founder, is how do you maintain your vision? Uh, in a way that it still your that you still it still has your spirit. How's your product still has your spirit, uh, and how you onboard people uh, that can tag along with your dream, with your vision, uh, and then you can explain them what it is that you uh, you know your vision, your view, um, without without them to see that in in a way that it can reflect what it is that you want to you want it to be, if it makes sense. Absolutely, and I think you just keep trusting your instincts. It's like you you know you're gonna fall down, you're gonna make mistakes, but it's how you turn those mistakes around into opportunities to learn and do it differently. You know, or what I've found is there's always something that's coming your way that you don't see. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it would, you know, that's I think the best. So, so, so you're it. here. There are a lot of. Uh, established retailers who are wandering the corridors of the World Retail Congress, hopefully will come and talk to you. Um, what are the challenges that you face as a young entrepreneurial business working with some of these big established retail companies and brands? Where should I start? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I am a retailer at my other job, and so it's interesting. Yeah, let you go first. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think um, yeah, it also depends on the type of retailers that you that you're working in. For us, we uh, we work with you know some tier one retailers that uh, the demands are are, are there. Um, 
I think you have to be absolutely confident that you can deliver uh, in that quality uh, that you're, you know, the solution uh, that you provide, whatever it is that you uh, you say that you're providing, uh, you have to be 100% um, sure that you can you can deliver, um, and you are being tested for that. So if you are a young company uh, from anywhere in the world, it can be Israel or anywhere, uh, a retailer would really want to know that this is something solid. In our case, uh, we're talking about changing their their uh, their interface. Uh, so this is this is their face for their consumers. It's a big deal. Uh, they're not. It's not something that you will throw at the back, and then if it doesn't work, they can yeah. change it again. This is really, uh, that's why we call the new face of mobile shopping. So you're not going to change face every day. Exactly. Right? And the opposite of them, we actually have an opportunity for retailers to go in and see with the percentage, because we have instant percentage results that pop up that shows what's resonating with the consumer. So we have an opportunity for retailers to come in, almost taking over for that trade show, which are slowly dying. Having been a retailer for 15 years, I go to the shows now, and I mean, people like me can walk up and sign up a designer for a digital platform and not buy clothes. And I think for us, retailers have an opportunity to go in and look at our collections and be like, the designer's collections go, oh, 70% like this, 40% like this. So I think our data, and data I think for you is probably just as strong as it is for me. Yeah, it's, I, think, I think it's probably the most valuable thing today. It's uh, how you can collect data, but just in the right amount. And also with this, in, in, the, in, in the limitations of what it is that is, you sure, can, but also you can, you know, it's, it's about how you convert that data to something that's useful in sight or meaningful and you can exactly. take an action mm -hmm. to, as opposed to, you know, a random collection of data stuff. Yeah. And, well, um, and it's real time. For us, it's real time consumer preferences. So it's like that data is there. Also, our designers are now putting up stuff that's coming out six months from now to, you know, put for those retailers. And maybe also how you take that data and make something more of it. How can you generate new insights that can be le can can be leveraged not only by the retailer but the entire ecosystem, uh, the, the brands themselves. In your case, the designers. In our case, the, the CPGs or any any brands that sells through the retailers. How can you um, actually uh, create new insights that can help them uh, do better, uh, better know their customers, better uh, create uh, their products in a, in a better way. And to help increase that full price sell through, yes. you know, and yeah. get get away from all these high markdowns. So finally, how would you sum up the life of an entrepreneur in a couple of words? Your life. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's you know it's crazy. It's wonderful. It's dysfunctional. It's it, but it's it's beautiful. It's you know at the end of the day you you get to it, you get pride in the fact that you've created something that is meaningful and that can benefit not only in our case designers and retailers but also our consumers. Exciting, literally exciting. I think the excitement uh, and and the way. Um, you can actually learn things every day and, and actually be responsible for for your, your own destiny. I think this is this is the most exciting thing. Great. Well, maybe we should pop around to, to see you film it. Maybe we'll put uh, both your uh, your uh, innovations in our program for tomorrow. But in the meantime, Adam Kimberley, yeah. thank you very much for joining us. It's been a you. pleasure. Thanks for having us. Pleasure for having you. Thank, thank you. you. Well, um, almost the end of our broadcast today, and we are now joined live by Ian McGarrigal, the Chairman of the World Retail Congress. Ian, always a pleasure. I can't believe it's a year since uh, we did this uh, last time. No, nope. where's that year gone? In fact, um, such a lot's happened, hasn't it? In well, a lot, of, a lot of retailers have come and gone in that, <laughs> in that right. period. And, you know, some have, uh, lots have arrived as well, so that, which is a good thing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, reflections after day one. Um, it's great to be up and running. It's good. Great to see, uh, I think it's all great, you know, um, so many people from literally all over the world, um, that's fantastic, so that's a great, great buzz, it feels good, um, the content feels really relevant, which is a huge relief, and I think, uh, um, really pleased, because, you know, we've got quite a strong theme this year, which, um, high velocity retail, which grew out of our, our research, and it just, uh, um, the opening sessions where we presented the research from OCNC on what is high velocity retail, you know, what do you need to win in this high velocity retail world, um, was, has been very well received and it's been picked up already. People are using that language and they're talking about it, referring back to uh, what does high velocity retail mean. And, uh, and of course uh, in that we included uh, a lot of data from uh, WPP and Kantar Branzi. 
Yeah, and that, that was terrific because I think um, that's come up time and time again. It's talk about the strength and the importance of brand within that. What does the brand mean? Um, and people that succeed really focusing around the customer. And I think those all those elements are absolutely joined together. So the brandsy uh, data and input uh, has been really critical to the, the power and strength, I think, of the high-velocity retail report. What are the themes have you seen uh, from today? We were both in a, a session uh, by uh, JD.com. Uh, interesting perception views that they have about where retailing is going and their positioning for the future. Shall we all yes. be scared? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's um, again, referring back to the high velocity retail report, those discussions, there was certainly a model that uh, uh, without the involvement of humans, so to speak, it's all about algorithms and uh, robots. And I think uh, JD are an exponent um, of that. But, but I think um, the chief strategy officer at the JD session was, was definitely talking about the online to offline. and. Um, Actually, it was a nice reminder that uh, you know that there's a huge amount of uh, retail in China done through stores. That's something. That's yeah, often I mean, I mean, he made the point, which you know, I, I think we forget at our peril that although China is the largest e-commerce market in the world and the growth rate of e-commerce is uh, is big, the growth rate is slowing down, and 80 percent of transactions are done physically. Well, that's right, and I think the story of China certainly has reflected at the Congress the last two or three years. You would think it's all about. Alibaba, Tmall, JD, uh, WeChat, all, all those uh, online channels. Um, and that was yeah, an interesting, uh, refreshing reminder. And um, you know, the focus around well, what, what makes those 80% of retail work in, in China. And I think that's something we're seeing, aren't we, with uh, Alibaba's Hummer uh, concept, which uh, I think uh, I've, I've heard a lot in terms of you know, what Hummer is and Alibaba are trying to do with that is, is absolutely a model that people need to look at with that, that joined up thinking about uh, uh, the, the, the role of the store. What else has captured your uh, imagination this afternoon? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think uh, we've, we've heard some great um, presentations. It was great to hear uh, Walter Koch from uh, the CEO of Arholt. It's his first uh, major keynote, which is great. We're really, really pleased and, uh, you know, I think, again, he just touched on so many of the themes that uh, seem to uh, seem to resonate uh, but we've heard this afternoon from a great panel of uh, all female disruptors um, from the states um, Orchard Mile Universal Standard and uh, and Laleen who are well, yeah they're disrupting their sectors but it's uh, for me it's that new refreshing approach to retail I mean a they're saying anything's possible we want to create new businesses they don't come from retail backgrounds they're thinking about the consumer base and uh, um, uh, as Universal Standard, Alex Warman said, you know, she created it out of necessity and necessity is yes. the mother of invention and I think that's that's really great to see that energy and that, that sort of uh, emergence of, uh, sort of fresh new thinking. And it's nice to see a load of young entrepreneurs here as absolutely. well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's... Uh, and I do feel that this year, actually, I mean, it's you know something you want to always reflect the industry you're in, um, and the industry today looks and feels very different from when we launched in 2007. And uh, um, you know, I think the feel and the energy of uh, just day one, and the people I know are here, and people that have spoken as well as in the audience, it does feel like this is you know a really true reflection of uh, where retail is today. Well, almost at the end of day one. Uh, busy evening for you, or can you relax? Uh, we've got a, a special dinner for our VIPs and speakers, of course we have. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I know there's some other events uh, going on this evening. Um, but hopefully not too much celebrations, because we've got a very busy day tomorrow. Well, we look forward to uh, speaking to you again uh, tomorrow. Um, Ian McGarrigal, Chairman of Retail Congress, thanks very much indeed for joining us. And that is the end uh, of today's live broadcast from the World Retail Congress 2019 here in Amsterdam. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Please join us again tomorrow as we look at uh, the events that happen, speak to some of the key retailers and speakers um, in tomorrow's uh, programme. Uh, as we further investigate the key issues that are impacting uh, retailing right across the world. My name is David Roth from WPP. It's been a pleasure to have you watching. Thank you very much indeed. Have a great rest of the day.